welcome to another video and today I'm going to give you five more mistakes that I used to make in wildlife photography. Look at this absolutely gorgeous English weather. Number one is underexposure. Now I used to do this regularly, this is a mistake I used to make and for some reason I used to underexpose a lot of my shots. I don't entirely know why, um, but looking back at old images and even looking back at transparencies, because I've actually got thousands of transparencies slides in a filing cabinet, I can see that I had a tendency to underexpose when it wasn't really necessary. So the thing with underexposing is yes there are times you need to do this. So if you're photographing a subject that's very white or it has a fair amount of white in it then you need to pay attention to that and you probably need to add some degree of underexposure. But what I'm talking about here is is trying to avoid underexposing when you definitely don't have to. So the reason for this is that it can affect your images. Uh, what happens if you underexpose and then you bring it back later so you brighten it up in post-processing what you'll find is it, it, it's a very good way of increasing the noise in your image. So if you underexpose and then brighten it up, it can really increase the noise levels. Obviously, it's going to depend to an extent uh, with your camera and how much you've underexposed and all that kind of thing. So if you have got a subject that really doesn't have any white in it and you don't need to underexpose, then just try and get the exposure as accurate as you can if you're able to and even consider overexposing a little bit maybe. Uh, this is something you can read about called exposing to the right you'll find lots of information about that on the internet so the bottom line is if you don't need to underexpose your image try to avoid doing so because you're potentially going to add more noise to your image later on The next one I used to do is forgetting to charge the batteries and this was a definite issue for me. It would be quite regular that I'd either completely forget or I'd, you know, I'd have a partially charged battery. And it's interesting because in a previous video I made, I had loads of people tell me that this is one of the mistakes they made, which is forgetting to charge their batteries. Loads of people told me this, exactly the same thing. Uh, so it's quite common. Now I don't know if there's a really good way of uh, getting yourself to remember to charge the battery. Maybe if you just take the battery out, take the battery out of the compartment um, with the camera so when you look at it you know that you need to charge it. If you have any other suggestions let me know in the comments box below. It's not a good thing when everything's perfect and you come to take your picture and the battery starts flashing and you know you haven't got that long to actually shoot with before the camera dies. And then you get into that situation of having to constantly turn the camera off to save battery and then switch it on again. Nobody wants to do that and I've done it numerous times. The problems with the batteries not being charged, obviously the camera might die completely, but I think also it can just slow things down. So I'm sure it can start to slow down autofocus. I actually think on my camera it can affect the continuous frame rate. It sounds different. I can actually hear it with my eye. It sounds different to me. And that is a sign to me that the, the battery uh, is on the way out. I need to change the battery. It's not charged enough. So if you have any suggestions on this one, let me know. Number three is not shooting wide open. And by this, I mean not shooting at the widest aperture available on your lens or or at least close to it. Now I used to, this is a habit I got into for a long time, even with a big 500 millimeter lens with which had an aperture of f4. And I think the reason was, uh, one of the reasons was that I was submitting pictures to picture libraries for example, I think they just preferred a little bit more depth of field in that. And I kind of got into that habit of just closing the aperture down. And that's not necessarily the wrong thing to do, but that was kind of my default position was to close the aperture down a bit, more like between f5.6 and f8 a lot of the time, just to get a bit more depth of field in the bird or the animal I was focusing on, but the background was still relatively out of focus. What I'd say is if you've got a big lens with a wide aperture of f4 or f2.8 then why not use that at least some of the time use that because you've got that facility there. There are a few advantages to keeping the aperture wide. Uh, firstly you can keep the shutter speed up, use a faster shutter speed which is always useful in wildlife photography. Secondly it helps you to keep the ISO down because you're letting in more light so you can use a lower ISO which is going to help the overall image quality. And then probably the most obvious one is simply the effect on the backgrounds. So if you use a very wide aperture like f4, f2.8 for example, you can really throw those backgrounds completely out of focus, add a lot of impact to your images with that shallow depth of field. So if you're not using 
the widest aperture all the time, then maybe give yourself a period of time where you do, just see if you like that. The next mistake I used to make was not pushing the ISO enough. Now, I'd say I'm definitely an advocate for keeping the ISO lower if you can, uh, particularly if your equipment is more sort of mid-range, certainly to the budget end. I would try and keep the ISO lower. But there are times where I think you just need to try and push it just to basically get an image, to get something out of that situation. So if we get into very, very low light and you have no other option but to push the ISO, and particularly if it's something, you know, really exciting, really different that you don't want to miss, then I would say just try and push the ISO and deal with the noise issues later on. So a perfect example of this was photographing the long-eared owls in Serbia, which I've shared a bit before. And here with my, what is it, Canon 1D Mark IV. I think it was the first time I did this with 1D Mark IV. Um, and I was trying to shoot them without any flash, without additional light, just with the artificial lights there and a little bit of twilight as well. And in this case, I just had to push the ISO. I couldn't get a fast enough shutter speed uh, to get a sharp image, even at the widest apertures. So I had to push the ISO and I pushed it more than I'd ever done before. And I pushed it in some images up to, I think about 5,000 and certainly with the DX after that. Uh, maybe even beyond 5,000. Now, surprisingly, a lot of those, a lot of those images are better than I expected. You know, they're okay for web use, for putting on YouTube. I wouldn't be too um, convinced about printing it. You know, as a large print, I wouldn't be too sure about that. But for smaller use on the screen, they're actually pretty acceptable. So even at ISO 5000, some of those images look surprisingly clean to me. And then what I tend to do is just a little bit of selective noise reduction. So I'll basically reduce the noise in the background uh, so it doesn't affect the bird. So know the limits of your camera for general shooting, but if you're in a more special situation and you have no choice, then push the ISO up and deal with the noise later. And the next mistake I used to make, and I still definitely do this one, I'm working on it, is that I just wouldn't change my settings quickly enough. So what I mean here is, it's more related to situations where you kind of have repeating patterns, uh, behavior, something that's repeated a number of times and you're constantly taking pictures to try and perfect and get that perfect one. Um, and in that situation, I would get my settings in the camera, get my exposure, my focus, and I'd keep taking the shots, but I just wouldn't get the image I was after. It wasn't really working, and being quite stubborn, I'm not a big fan of change as well, um, I'd often keep persisting with that. And that's fine to an extent, you need to keep persisting and taking lots of pictures sometimes to get the best one. But there's situations where I think you just need to accept, as I didn't always do, that it's just not working. So. If you've taken a lot of pictures and you're still not getting the shot that you've envisaged, that you've thought through, then maybe it's just a case of your settings aren't working for you. In that situation, think about changing something. So maybe now I'll think, okay, this, this just isn't working as I hoped it would. I'm gonna change my focus area, for example. Maybe the shutter speed simply isn't fast enough to do this. Maybe I need to change my exposure mode entirely. Instead of using manual, go to aperture priority or vice versa. Maybe I need to use manual ISO instead of auto. So nowadays I think I'm just faster to recognize the situation and look at the images and the sharpness and just say, okay, this isn't quite working. Can I change my settings to improve it rather than banging my head against the wall and wasting my time? I'm gonna try my very best to get another video out over the Christmas period, and that is gonna be some of my favorite images from 2021, so look out for that, because that's gonna be fan dabby dozy. And I'll see you somewhere in nature sometime soon, but if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe to the channel for more tutorials, and I'll see you next time.